did. I, the last time I've been to a salon here, because I'm obviously based in Los Angeles, was probably eight years ago with Doyle Young. Um, who just left us seven years and two days ago. And was a good friend, so it's a, it's a great honor that I get to be up here this time. Um, <laughs> I'll give you a, a very brief overview of what I have been doing and I'll tell you a little bit about the new book. Um, I do perfectly respectable books like this. Uh, this is a number of photography, 17. Um, I do art catalogs for up and coming painters. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I write my own books. Uh, it's called Graphic Eye, which was sort of like Instagram before Instagram. Uh, when art directors still had their little folder of, I took all these photos and if only there was a place for me to publish them, everybody would know how awesome I am as a photographer. <laughs> and of course, now you just pop it up on Instagram and people go, yeah, 13 likes, very good. <laughs> and at the time, it didn't exist. So I took book out of that. Um, and I do slightly less respectable books with uh, a bias cut. and borderline goofy books. This is the aforementioned self-help book with the incredibly long subtitle, um, which you have to have because of the Amazon. Um, and this is, by the way, uh, is a self-help book that's composed entirely of questions, uh, so that you never have that moment of going like, oh, this is very helpful, this is very helpful. And then it gets to the author's bio, and some way or there's a little bit of background on the, on the author. It's like, Oh, well, you know, my, my mother was an agent, and my father was the head of a movie studio, and magically I succeeded. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, great, thank you. Uh, so this is purely questions. It's called 344 questions, because my studio is 344 design, but there are, in fact, 1,484 bonus questions, because I like to deliver solid value. <laughs> <laughs> the Yeti, uh, also aforementioned, uh, was a character <coughs> designed for Saks Fifth Avenue. This was the... Uh, the Saxon Family storefront uh, a few years ago where they built the whole thing as a series of animatronics. So I've done a plush animal for them uh, for a covered book. And then they turned my book not into a movie, but into an animatronic experience, <laughs> which I highly recommend. <laughs> that was a real pleasure. Um, the movie titles. It's basically you're just now getting all the images that illustrate the bio that Carol just read for you. So that's a purpose. Um, the fall, the models, and mirror mirror. Uh, and mirror mirror definitely came, was happened just after Doyle Young <coughs> passed, and it came about uh, very mm, semi spontaneously because I've worked with Tarsem before. And I always kind of keep an eye on his IMDb page to see if he's got something in the hopper. Uh, because then his assistant called me and said, uh, Hey, has Tarsem talked to you? He's talked to you, right? No. Well, Tarsem thinks he's talked to you, so can you come in tomorrow and present something? <laughs> so at that point, it's very helpful if you actually have some sketches that you've already made. Uh, and then I spent uh, 18 hours and did an all nighter and sent things around to. Uh, Doyle, my mutual friend Mary, is like, is, is this curve good? Do you think Doyle would approve of this curve? <laughs> and um, that was hard to, to get that on the movie. Uh, more movie titles. Um, I got to make posters for planets, as one does. Um, the <coughs> NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory is in Pasadena, where I live. And they were doing this series of posters for the solar system. And they said, you want to do a poster for a planet? Like, yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Please. Um, they said, well, come on up to the lab, pick a planet. <laughs> <laughs> also, a lovely call to receive. And so I picked Jupiter. Uh, because much like myself, it's a gas giant. <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, and also, the Rosetta mission was going to, uh, to Jupiter that year on July 4th. So I was like, let me just be. Let me just be opportunistic and piggyback on actual massive scale science with my little poster. Um, if you haven't thought much about uh, the auroras on Jupiter, we haven't actually seen them, but they're projected to be really magnificent because of the magnetic field. If you think of the northern lights in Alaska, that's the Earth's magnetic field, which is relatively puny. 
And if you haven't thought much about the magnetic field on Jupiter, you should, because it keeps us from sort of dying. Um, keeps us from not having all kinds of asteroid bombardment all the time, and also keeps from being cooked by solar radiation. So, you know, give some thanks to Jupiter next time you look up. Um, and I occasionally also get to do some honest to God branding. Uh, this is the before of a culture, cultural organization nonprofit in Los Angeles called so the Public Square. Um, and they're sort of like the Atlantic or the New Yorker uh, online uh, of what they call ideas journalism, and they also have events like panel discussions with authors and social scientists and such. Um, and it was all, and Zocalo, by the way, is Spanish for, for town square. So it's kind of like the, the social center of the town where everybody comes and discusses it. And so I wanted to make it a little bit more interesting and a little bit more cubist because they look at things from different angles over time, which is like a cubist painting, but as journalism, don't you know? And so I thought, we'll take the square and we'll turn it into a Zocalo Hedron or what you might call a cube. Um, and that looks like this. <laughs> We're hoping to do a poster campaign, something in that vein. Purely, purely a Behance type projection at this point. Uh, but I got to do this, which I can't help but show you, because in 30 years of doing graphic design, this is the first time that I ac ever actually got to do stationery for a client. <laughs> um, I've done all kinds of stuff. I've designed a theater in Las Vegas. I've never designed letterhead for anybody except myself. And so after all these years, that very basic, fundamental piece of design currency is now mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I got converted up all this Anyway, so this just by way of saying, I too am a uh, an artist god typographer. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the new book and the new project. Um, and as it says, sometimes you have to go all the way around the world to meet your neighbors. I got to speak at a conference in lovely uh, downtown Dubai and got to see a talk by Neville Page who did the alien, or was the character design for Avatar and for all the new Star Trek properties um, and lives probably <coughs> about 15 minutes from <coughs> Los Angeles but got to fly all the way to Dubai to meet the man. <laughs> and he gave this great presentation on his sculpting process. He did a demo on a sculpting program called ZBrush, which is like sculpting in clay, but without being all messy and, <laughs> you know, which I don't like, certainly not around the office. So I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. I gotta get in on this. Um, went home, immediately got the software, um, and started sculpting. Then initially, you know, did a bunch of alien heads, because that's what Neville had done. I'm like, all right, well, let me put some horns on it, and then some more horns, and maybe some kind of pointy ears, because that's always good. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't take long for letter forms to enter the picture, because at the end of the day, I'm always one for letters, and, I, and I, I'm always one for a series of things, because it's nice to push myself through um, a kind of mandatory number of iterations on something. Um, this is roughly what this looks like. Um, where you just start by sculpting something fairly abstract and uh, you kind of create your own lump of clay and then you start sculpting. And if you're familiar with my Daily Monsters where I found myself um, doing characters based on a random blot of ink that I blow out with an air gun, um, everything is always about placement of, of key things. So where does the mouth go? Where do the eyes go? Where's the nose? Um, and I, as soon as I started doing letters, it's like, right, I'm going to do a full alphabet, obviously. Because, <laughs> um, you know, obviously I could have just done, all right, I'll do my initials, or I'll do ABC or something like that, but I, I, like, I like a challenge. Um, 
And it's really, it's unbelievable fun to work in the program. And it's probably as much fun as I've had on the computer since learning Photoshop over these many years ago. Um, and it combines, the nice thing is, for me is that it combines all the things that I've learned from doing photo retouching and from doing art direction and illustration and creating the characters from the Daily Monster and Philly Lecter Company. Um, plus I get to do it in three dimensions and as with the monsters before, there's a moment where I get to meet a new character. And that's always the point where I know that I'm getting somewhere is when it stops being a sculpture or it stops being a drawing and it becomes an actual living personality or a <coughs> Who are you? What are you all about? This guy seems slightly mean, or possibly you know, skeptical, as you'd expect from a question. <coughs> um, always lots of, a lot of work around the eyes. Um, this is about, this was a fairly quick one, the question mark, and that's about five hours of work condensed about three minutes. Um, the, the characters in the book took a lot longer than probably about 24 hours work each on, uh, on ZBrush sculpting alone. And what was wonderful about it is also that I got to come in on it as a newbie. Whereas with Photoshop, I, you know, or Illustrator, or God knows, analog media, I know what works, it doesn't work, and I have my little bag of tricks, and I, I know what's reliable. And with this, every day, if I wanted to do something and I had an idea, I had to figure out from scratch of how to actually make that happen. And figure out little workarounds or you know, take the things that I already knew how to do and combine them in, in interesting ways to sort of hack my way to what I wanted to do. Um, by the way, wrinkles are always super helpful. It, it's, with sculpture, it's so, as soon as you can just put a lot of wrinkles on it, everything starts looking better. Um, I'm hoping for that point to happen in my life. Um, <laughs> they make it look they make it look more real and believable. That so maybe that maybe that will be as you know, as I age, like over the decades I'll just get more and more plausible. <laughs> um, then you can really rock out on a nice pop of your So that's kind of the, the, the process of, of creating the characters initially. Um, it's almost done. There's always a lot of hair. The nice thing is that it also has an auto symmetry <coughs> feature. So you start you start out with everything being super, super correct versus drawing, you know, drawing property properly academically where it's just so easy to screw up. And then you have to actually go in and kind of mess up the symmetry a little bit so that it doesn't get all uncanny valley and gross. Um, yeah, not quite sure. A little bit more on the sideburns. A little bit more on the left. An extra piss off of this. Yes. How much more judgmental can it be? Possibly a little bit more work on the eyebrows. That I suspect is going to happen in a minute. Um, so that's the wonderful thing where usually, again, I couldn't rely on a bag of tricks and I could just look at also some of the default behavior of the program, like that clay color, that kind of gray, pewtery, wax clay texture. That ZBrush experts have told me they just frown on. I was like, no, 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 that's just the default. That's like, we don't want to do that. You know, you need to put a nice, believable skin color on it. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, this is really, really beautiful just the way it is which is a real luxury to be able to come in on a program like that. Um, <coughs> and um, so, so I did. And by the way, the example for that is, if remember when you started in Photoshop and you discovered the lens flare filter? There's like a six, like a six hour time period where you're like, oh my god, this is amazing, I love this. And then you sort of gradually go, oh, okay, well I should probably use this really, really sparingly. Um, so this is uh, how it comes out of ZBrush. And initially, uh, I wanted to stick with that entirely. Because I had, I always have little internal rules for myself with these projects, like the Daily Monster, I have a rule that 
no monster ever appears twice. So if somebody wanted to make a t-shirt or something like that, it would have to make a new monster. Kind of like a Lars von Trier in a less thickish way. Um, <laughs> um, but at the same time, this was then also going to be printed very, very nicely with stochastic screening and high resolution and all that kind of thing. And all of a sudden, you go like, oh, wait a second, there's possibly a few things that are a little bit rough. And then I do think that a lot of sort of current stochastic <coughs> is indicated. Um, and the kind of um, Disney princess hair actually takes a lot of work, no matter how you slice it. If you're doing it with an actual photo, if you're doing it with a sculpted character, um, yeah, it takes work. And then, of course, these I also have to then correct from the back as well, because in the book you see it front and back. Um, and again, Disney princess hair, difficult. Choppy male hair, very, very easy. This is how it comes out of the program. This was the adjustment. The highlights in the eyes. There was this little thing that wasn't cooperating. And also the crow's feet. <laughs> Uh, and crow legs, you know, a little bit of adjustment. Um, and then in the book, you actually get to see the back. So whatever change I make to the front that affects the silhouette had to then be carried over to the back um, because I like to make it complicated for myself. Um, and of course the challenge was, it's a 3D object. How do I put it into book form in a way that still sells you on the idea that it is a, a three-dimensional object? Um, so this way the hope is that you look at look at it and go, oh, it's sort of a character suspended in the force field of the page. Um, and if that isn't good enough for you, then there are the end sheets where you get a 360 degree turn on every character to really give solid proof of the proper 3D-ness of things. Uh, in the index, uh, there's an explanation uh, what every background color is. So a is apple green, B is burgundy, B is C is selenite. You get the idea. Cyan is selenite. Uh, sorry, you go jade. You get the idea. It's you know, it's a thing. And then uh, every character is named after some people in my life. So uh, Deidre is Doyle, and then uh, Lillian's cat is Leah after Leah Hoffman, who was my first typography and lettering teacher, and who now has the Hoffman's Milk and Center for Typography named after her in Los Angeles. If you're ever out my way, check that out, because Gloria Conrad was running an amazing letterpress set up there. Um, and a few special features. The book has yellow forages, so it's like a whole nice big slice of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, all the head and tails. I could have obviously gone with a yellow headband, but that would be obvious and gauche. And so instead, it's variegated orange and white, so that it looks like yellow from a distance, but from up close, it's like an orange Julius. Because I like delicious. <laughs> um, but I want to show you the book proper, and this is as this is sort of book reading. Um, I would read it to you, uh, but considering the significant emotional depth of the subject and the uh, just the resonance of feeling. I don't think that I'm quite adequate with my voice, so I've asked my friend Mark Evan Jackson from Brooklyn Nine-Nine to read it to you. Unnamed Press presents an abridged recording of Stefan G. Bucher's Letterheads, an eccentric alphabet, narrated by me, Mark Evan Jackson. Chapter 1, A. Chapter 2, B. <laughs> Chapter 3, C. Chapter 4, D. <coughs> Chapter 5, E. Chapter 6, F. <laughs> Chapter 7, G. Chapter 8, H. Chapter 9, I. Mm. Chapter 10, J. Chapter 11, K. Chapter 12, 
L. Chapter 13, M. Chapter 14, N. Chapter 15, O. <laughs> Chapter 16, P. Hair. Chapter 17, Q. I wanted to be Chapter 18, R. Chapter 19, S. Chapter 20, T. Chapter 21, U. Chapter 22, V. Chapter 23, W. Chapter 24, X. Chapter 25, Y. Chapter 26, Z. The end. This audiobook was presented by Unnamed Press. Unnamed Press. The press without a given name. <coughs> it's about telling stories, obviously. Every letter has a little story prompt. Like Beatrice and Bertram and Versailles and uh, Ingmar's and Bertram and things like that. And of course, that's only the beginning. It's, you know, they're really meant as little story starters if you're looking at it with kids or if you're looking at it yourself or with friends, that you can tell stories together. And I think it's a nice and kind of sort of important thing to do because I think if you're making up a story together, it's hard to be angry. And I think that's important these days. And one of my big things these days is like, how can you put moments of kindness into the world? And I think both by putting little things to discover into the world, like little Easter eggs. Um, it gets people into a, into a space of kindness and also by inviting them to create stories with us uh, is a way to bring kindness into the world. Because it's very hard to work together on a story and be like, oh, what do you think they do? Oh, yeah, well, I think, you know, like they met 15 years ago at a train station when they were both reading the schedule and then they were going to the same place and helping each other out or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, no, I see that. Maybe they were very disconnected because you know they're both, you know, one of them's an S and the other one is not an S. Um, and they go, wow, yeah, that's a great idea. Also, fuck you, I hate you. Like that doesn't happen. Or if you have something, if you make somebody notice something that's a little bit magical and a little bit unexpected, you don't go, wow, that is awesome. That is really pretty. And you're wrong, and I hate you. <laughs> And I think these days, there's, I mean, there's not a lot we can do about sort of the, the greater state of the world, but I think we can, we can create these little pockets of micro-amazement to bring people out of that kind of locked-in aggressive stance. And I think that's a not unimportant thing we can at least attempt to do. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a privilege for me that I get to do that. And <coughs> it's a privilege that I get to do it here. And it's sort of a miracle that this book even exists. Because it's another one of these books that I seem to specialize in that have a not laser sharp audience focus in terms of, right, well, this is for, you know, children aged 7 to 11. Um, but only in urban areas <laughs> over a size. I mean, none of my books are that. They're always like, well, yeah, OK, well, that's interesting. Why does that exist? <laughs> um, and it exists out of a desire to just make little pockets of you know, something unexpected and hopefully delightful. And I was really lucky to find uh, unnamed press, who are a small independent publisher in Los Angeles. Uh, I showed it around a little bit, and, and the, the more hard-nosed publishers were very much like, yeah, this looks great. We have no idea who to sell this to. And then unnamed press was like, 
you know what, this is great. We have no idea who to sell this to, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> um, and so I'm grateful to them, and I'm grateful to you for being here today and for supporting another one of my you know, kind of crazy little adventures. Um, and I want to, whenever I do these things, I want to do this thing, but then I also want to do things around the thing to make the thing more fun for you. And so, as the last thing I'll show you, um, I asked a friend to help me out to create a, a special little item. Um, and that is, a few years ago, I started working with Wesley Stace, who was a singer-songwriter who used to go by the name John Wesley Harding. I started doing some posters for him. I did an animated video for him. Those 1800 rotoscope drawings, which is something I don't recommend as a pathway to profitability. <laughs> um, you know, but I'm in good with him. And so when the book was growing and becoming real, I asked him if maybe he'd write a song about the book. Um, I said, well, you know what? Michael Crichton doesn't have a song about his books. Amy <laughs> <laughs> Tan doesn't have a book. Has, no, she doesn't have music with her books. But I do. Um, and so as the last thing, I'll show you the Letterhead's Alphabet song. If you're, if you're moved to, to sing along or hum along, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> Apple green, little green apples, and B is for burgundy wine. C is for cyan, and D is for Diane, who thinks daffodil yellow's divine. You already knew that E is for A crew, and I'd hate to confuse you. It's F U for fuchsia, and everyone knows that G's as good as gold. Well, this alphabet's good, this alphabet's better You better follow it right to the letter Or else I'll have something to say The letterhead's alphabet way H is for heliotrope And I hope you know I is for indigo blue J is for Jane Cock, he's okay And L is for lemon jello well, please don't get flustered. M is for mustard, M is for name in blue. O for orange occasion, color of custard. And there's no excuse, but P is for peace. This alphabet's best, this alphabet's better. You better follow it right to the letter, or else I'll have something to say. The letter's alphabet way. Every head has a letter. Every letter has a head, it's up to you To give everyone its due, oh, letters of people too R is for rust, salmon, hell, pinkish, you see. Turquoise to the T, you are ultramarine, ultraviolet, rays, very UV. Well, no, now it gets tricky, it ends rather stickily, the Y is alive in the swamp. X is for Zan, Y is for Isidore, Z, usually zebra, is song. Well, this alphabet's best. Alphabet's better, and you better follow it right to the letter, or else I'll have something to say. The letterhead's alphabet way, the letterhead's alphabet way. Now backwards. Z one X O Q D U T S R Q P O N M L K H I N G F E D C B A. Have you ever thought of, um, much like the Funko Pop company, creating these in 3D and then seeing if like there was a market for them in Barnes & Noble that's more tactile? Yeah, because you go to Target and you see like, yeah. oh, my, le you know, my letter form and my name. And I think these would just be so much more illustrative and, and tan you know, tactile to 
purchase and have in your bookshelf? Yeah, I mean, I've definitely thought about it. It's a cost question. Yeah. Um, I have the A printed, which costs about 450 bucks. Wow. Um, oh. and it's, it's about like 1500 to tool them as toys oh. each. Oh. And then it's not a thing where you can just do them one at a time, so it's 1500 times 26. Um, <coughs> that's why it's a book right away. <laughs> <laughs> but if anybody has, you know, like Rockefeller money and wants to do public sculpture, sculpture, they're ready to go. I mean, all I have to do is print. So, uh, but, yeah. Yes. Did you begin in sculpture for the free version, or did you immediately go to ZBrush? That's an investment. Yeah, no, I immediately went to ZBrush. You did? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm really crap at sculpting in real life. Um, well, sculptures is like the... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sculptures is another free version of it. Oh! Yeah. It's like a free version. Um, it doesn't have as many add-ons, I think. Um, oh, it doesn't. now you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Had I known, I would have absolutely gone to sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> so but now hard. I have, now if I wanted to put a uh, tank train track <laughs> on them, <laughs> I'd be all good. Or, uh, you know, video game gun barrels, if I'm all stocked up on those apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I actually got a shout out from the ZBrush mothership, like Pixelogic actually posted about it, because I'm like, well, this is not something people usually do with it. <laughs> so that was really nice. Cool. I'll look into this. <laughs> it's really buggy on Mac, so be careful. Oh, well, there you go. Okay, well, that will feel not unfamiliar at all. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the better investments I made with it, by the way, is I, I mean, when I saw Neville's presentation, he's a pro. He does it all the time. He's been doing it for 20 years, and so he made it look really, really easy. You know, and home, like, yeah, we'll just do what Neville was doing. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I you know, cranked out my old 12 inch Wacom tablet and, like, <coughs> and then I did this and nothing happened. Um, and I was like, right, I have a round ball of wax and I can do nothing at all with it. And then I actually I hired a student to help me just, like, how do you open a document? How do you, and she's like, I'm like, I have ball. Why ball not scut? <laughs> and she's like, well, you have to hit edit. Oh. Oh. Okay. I'm like, how do I turn it? Oh, you do this, and then you pull out a thing, and you handle it, and you turn it. Oh. And so that's something that is easy to forget. The sort of the further away you get from school, as oh right, you can hire teachers to help you with these things, which is which was a embarrassingly eye-opening thing. It shouldn't have been, and I always have teachers in my life but just really kind of brass tax instruction stuff. It was it was interesting, because I tried doing the YouTube tutorials, and I tried doing the Linda.com stuff and everything, and I was like, right, this is such a basic problem I'm having here, they don't even cover it. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, right, well, obviously, you're allowed around electrical equipment, so we're not going to have to go over this. I'm like, no, please, go over it. <laughs> Um, it's a lot of uh, a lot of creature design for movies, so it's for the early stages of, of designing the creature. So in that sense, I'm kind of using it not off-label, um, but it's usually used more in the Klingon realm than in the metaphor form design. Um, and uh, yeah, so for that, and then you can also do hard shapes with it. So a lot of uh, like video game weapons and stuff. People seem to be very, very into the making of things that things or people that kill. Um, oh. it seems to be a preoccupation, and then um, a lot of sort of anime characters with unbelievable flowing hair. <laughs> it's very much. It seems to be. I don't know. That, I mean, I'm not privy to their consumer statistics. I suspect very young, very male. Um, just, just based on the work being produced. Yeah. Do you think this is sort of like this program, some, something you're going to use in the future for other stuff, or do you think this sort of not the 3D program is not the kind of thing you'll be using? 
for other stuff. Oh no, I'm definitely going to be using this more. Um, and this is, I mean, this was one of the reasons why I dove into it as much as I did, is because it's so hard to find something new in graphic design. Um, because it used to be that there was sort of like the party line, like, right, it's the 60s, we're all doing this now. And it's the 70s, so we're all doing like, it's, it's what we did in the 60s, but groovier. <laughs> um, and in the 80s, everything went kind of wrong, and then, you know, but there was like a party line, like there was the fashion, and then it was fairly easy to be a rebel by just not doing that. And starting, I guess, around 2000 with just with online galleries, it's very, very hard to piss anybody off anymore. And it's very, very hard to surprise anybody anymore because everything goes all the time. Like whatever you're doing in, in art, um, you're going to find 50,000 people who are also doing that on, on Behance or wherever you go. Um, and um, so with this, I think there's still a little bit of a technological hurdle to overcome. And not everybody is on that program yet. And so as soon as I saw it, I was like, man, I want to get in on that while there's still a little bit of unclaimed land on the map. Mm -hmm. um, and so I definitely want to use it more. And these are because I had a very clear sort of internal brief with it if I wanted to make this alphabet of characters. Um, they're very kind of pure in their construction. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create this stuff and then I'm going to fuck it up really bad and just chop it up and do a deconstructive thing with it or just do it as a partial thing or do it as a drop cap and, real, and sort of then bring my experience as a graphic designer, as a sort of more classically trained graphic designer to it and just, you, and just create um, ingredients basically. Yeah, so yeah, yeah no, I'll, I'm all in on this. There's wine in the back. <laughs> so I think we can turn the lights back on. Thank you again for coming.